Spirit is in B, which I, I have it tomorrow. Hey, good morning, Pursuit. If you would, stand, continue to meet and greet and get ready for some worship. Even if I run away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercy for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but the joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. And the waters deep, not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm was far too wide. Never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but the joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Worthy of every 
love song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Worthy.
Spirit, guide us with your presence, how we need you, God. And oh, Lord, lead us to your kingdom, bring us back to freedom, how we need you, God, how we need you, God. Oh, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Guide us by your presence. How we need you, God. And oh, Lord, we must sing your praises. You are our salvation. Be our strength and song. How we need you, God. How we need you, God. How we need you, you make this your prayer oh lord fill us with your spirit guide us by your presence how we need you god and oh lord we must sing your praise you are our salvation, be our strength and song. How we need you, oh Lord, fill us with your spirit, guide us by your presence. How we need you, God. Oh Lord, fill us with your praises. You are our salvation. How we need you, God. 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 You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome again to uh, Pursuit Church. Uh, I just feel like it's been a little bit of heaven here this morning with us gathering together. I say it almost every week, this is the best day of the week. Um, why? Because we're here to worship and turn our attention completely on God. So thank you for coming um, to this best day of the week at Pursuit Church. Uh, Pursuit Church is a church that is pursuing uh, belonging, believing, and becoming. And so this means that in this culture where there is so much electronic connectedness that there's more and more disconnectedness than ever before in our society. And so we want to be a place of belonging here at, at Pursuit. And Pursuit is a place like that. It's a place where you can belong. People are going to know your name. Um, they're going to pray with you and pray for you. And uh, we include everyone, no matter what, uh, no matter where they are in their current place of faith. And so we also, uh, as people belong and see others that are changed by Christ, uh, they also come to believe in Christ too. And uh, when they believe, we want them to grow into everything that God wants them to be. And so we want to become what God has in mind for us. And so this is our mission, and uh, it's our mission also that everyone here uh, has that mission for their, their life, to help people belong, believe, and become. And so thank you for coming this morning. Now, um, 
I want to ask a question. This is my own personal survey. So just raise your hand if you have ever watched an episode of the TV series The Chosen. Okay, I just want to see who has and maybe who hasn't. And so a good number of us have, a good number of us haven't. And so what I'd like to do right now is, uh, so my, let me back up. My wife and I started binge watching this TV series called The Chosen. And it is a Life of Christ uh, TV series. And it's better than anyone I've ever seen before. Um, just the dramatics and the, just the acting and everything about it. Um, it seems so vivid and real uh, to the life of Christ. And, uh, but there's a, after the second season of this chosen series, they invited nine Gen Z students to come and binge watch this TV series. They didn't really tell them what was going on. But they brought them to Utah and they, the students all gathered together and they binge watched this, this chosen video. And so what I'd like to do right now is just show you um, the little three-minute clip about that. And uh, so then we're going we're gonna to have some prayer uh, for Gen Z and students. So Gen Z, by the way, is basically anybody that's born, um, I guess, the year 2000 or later. Um, I think that's right. And so the freshmen's in college and, and uh, you know, that, that age group is what we would call Gen Z. So let's, let's, uh, let's play that video. <clears throat> I chose not to believe in anything. And I said, if I want to believe in God, you know, I'd have to believe in aliens and Sasquatches and the Loch Ness Monster and stuff like that. I think if Jesus were here right now, I wouldn't be ready to meet him. I feel guilty for so many things, and I just don't feel like I'm out at a place where I'd be okay facing him. I like to assume the best in people. And so when I'm in church, every time I see people, I always assume that they have their lives together. And I'm just like, here. Religion quite often is something that we've been a little disenchanted by. I'm not deeply into the faith like I used to be. I don't want to serve a God that condemns good people to hell. What if I just die and burn it for eternity, you know, because maybe they were right. I was saying to God, like, am I an awful person? And I just couldn't hear God's voice about it. I have so much doubt. What is the point of life? Why am I here? Do I even want to still be here? It was so intense to be dropped into a group where everyone had such a complex relationship with God and with Christianity. The experience was unlike anything I've really experienced before. Not knowing what religious TV show we're about to sit on a couch and binge watch with random strangers. We don't care if you love it, hate it. We hope you can at least relate to it. Help us understand what's happening here. This is not what I thought it was going to be, but it brings yeah. you in. It reminded me a lot of like Thanksgiving time with my friends. I mean, it seems cool, but I feel like very wary about entering into that domain again. I kind of terrified of going back to church because I felt like no one protected me. When I was little, I would pray and I felt like I wasn't hurt. I really have struggled in loving myself had to leave and like I was in an awful life situation. The fact that like Jesus is in here and he's saying, well, I came here for you. It was, it was big, I really liked that. If Jesus can love me, then I should be able to love me. God is calling you. There are people I've had in my life for years that don't know me like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they're about to. Uh, so um, there was actually a two-hour uh, <coughs> live stream of those students watching uh, the uh, the Chosen, and I would I would like for our church to come together to to do that because what it really showed me is 
really how much we need to be praying for this Gen Z. Um, the Gen Z is, honestly, it's, our culture has exploded and come apart at the seams, and the Gen Z generation kids are just kind of the collateral damage in a lot of ways. And so even with these nine kids, these nine random kids that came together, they told their stories, and there was, there was thoughts of suicide, there was depression, there was abuse in the church and in their families and all sorts of things, just with this random sample of, of nine students. And so we need to be praying. Um, we need to be praying for our, our ministry as a church to, to UCF campus and, uh, and, and everything we can do to be part of this community. So we're, we're not a... We're not a, a church that's going to aim at only one segment of society. We are we are diverse, but we want to begin ministries in every different every different segment, so that all of us can be involved in in bringing the light to the world. So, what I'd like to do right now is uh, um, introduce Brian Rosenbaum. Um, he's a, he's a leader of our what we call Pursuit Nights uh, student ministry, and so I'd like I'd like Brian to. Come on up and just say a few things about himself and what, what Pursuit Nights is going to be doing. <clears throat> Good morning. Can you hear me? Well, thank you, Pastor Dave, for that introduction. Of course, like he said, my name is Brian Rosenbaum, and I am the leader of Pursuit Nights here. Of course, a little bit about my background. I came here nine years ago, studied at UCF, Go Knights, Charge On, lived across the street at Night Circle. I know some of you probably live there or live there now, hopped the fence one day, because there used to be a restaurant where I used to watch UCF football games, big sports fans. So I walk across. I saw that old sign on the side of the church. I decided to look it up and see, what, is this a church? Went home, Googled it, came the next Sunday. Of course, met Pastor Dave, had lunch at his house, and of course, the rest is history. So about three years ago, when Pastor Dave stepped up to become the pastor, he passed the torch to me to lead Pursuit Nights. And really what this group is about is really how can we grow, college students particularly, how can we grow in the Lord and thrive in college during these four years of our lives? Because again, college is definitely tough. Growing, leaving the house, trying to figure out what you're gonna study vocationally, lots of choices, lots of friends, lots of groups, but the foundation has to be the gospel, and that's what we're all about at Pursuit Nights. Of course, we meet probably gonna be Monday night, still trying to hash out the details, but really what we do is we, we pray, we share a meal, we study the Bible, and we really grow in glorifying God in all that we do, especially not just in our studies, but really in all things that we do. So, again, I see a lot of new faces out there, so again, want to welcome you all to Pursuit. Definitely after the service, if you ever want to hang around, talk to me. Again, my phone number, I think it should be on the slide up there. I think it's 907-952-1742, so if you ever want to connect, get lunch or something, here, reach out to me. My phone's always open, so... One more thing, go Knights. Here we go. Well, this, this morning we also have a, a special pleasure. Um, some of you know uh, our retired Pastor Bill uh, Malik and his wife Karen is here and their daughter, daughter Abby and uh, some of their friends uh, from around the state and around the country. So they, we got to celebrate a 50th wedding anniversary for them last Ooh. night. And... Uh, <clears throat> So that was a lot of fun, and uh, you know, Bill is Bill is the one that really, um, really made Pursuit Church what it is, and uh, Bill and Karen and their ministry together, and it's a lasting ministry. There's people here in this room that that came to Christ through him, that have been ministered to him, you know, by him and Karen, and are are still following the Lord today, and I'm and I'm one of them. So I count Bill a very special friend. Uh, unique in my lifetime. And so I'd like to ask Bill to come and pray uh, for our church and also uh, just for the Gen Z students and, and what we're trying to do here. Thank you, Dave. And you can preach a sermon if you want. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Dangerous to put this in my hands, I'll tell you. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to speak to you who are beginning 
a wonderful quest that God has called you on. I want to read a passage. The Lord put it on my heart as we were talking about Gen Z. And it's just about a guy who is a believer. He wasn't one of Jesus' disciples, but he was certainly following. And the Lord put on his heart something in, in Acts chapter 8. It says, the Lord spoke to Philip and said, get up and go south. On that road, you will find an individual. Share with him. God is going to be speaking to you in these days that you will trust him. There will be people that you will meet whom God is preparing, whom God has made a special appointment with that individual. And at that point, you need to obey God and speak and invite them here, invite them to go out for a hamburger, live a life of sacrifice for Christ, and you'll have his fruit. Pray with me as we begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the fact that Jesus said to his disciples that he would send his Holy Spirit and he would reside with us, lead us, guide us, fill us, baptize us, use us forever. And in this generation of Gen Z, where people are lost and divided, and fearful, and angry, and suspicious. We pray, Father, that you would set in this week, in this time, divine appointments, and that we would respond to those divine appointments, and that we would go, and we would speak, and we would be the light of the world to those who you are preparing to bring to yourself. Father, we thank you for the fruit which we know you will bring about. And Father, we pray for the use of this movie, The Chosen, as we realize, Father, that we are part of a mission reaching those who are chosen by you to introduce them to the light, that they might respond and that they might know the freedom of the forgiveness of sins and the joy of walking with Jesus. In his holy and precious name, we pray and we give you this hour. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand for our offering and worship. Can we make this a prayer? Take all I have in these hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire. Take all I have in these hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. Here I am, God. Arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken. My heart stands in all of Your name, Your mighty love stands. Strong to the end, you will fulfill your purpose in me. You won't forsake me, you will be with me. Here I am, God, arms wide open. 
you would give us the grace to hold our arms wide open and for you to find our hearts on the altar gracefully broken. Lord, prepare our hearts to be stirred by your word. Feed our faith and stir up your life in us. We ask this in your nature, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, you may be seated. <clears throat> the children can be dismissed to their class. So the title of this uh, sermon is Changed People Be Like. Um, now, the very first color image of the whole earth was taken from space by the Dodge Satellite in 1967. So there it is. Um, the Dodge Satellite is not like the car company. Like There is a Tesla in space, but the Dodge, I don't know, it's some acronym. But OK, so this first picture of the whole Earth was taken in 1967. Now, a better photo.
from, um, uh, from Apollo 17, actually it says a better selfie with the iPhone 13, um, was taken just a few years later. But the point is, um, isn't it something, isn't it amazing how many years of human history it took before we could really get far enough away to, to get the big picture? And so, of course, you needed technology to build a rocket to send into space, uh, you know, a camera to, to shoot that pic. But the book of Matthew in the first few chapters is really an example of finally being able to get far enough away to see the big picture. And uh, so Matthew had the vantage point of being, of course, with Christ and seeing the culmination of thousands of years of God's redemptive plan coming to be. And so the promised Jewish Messiah that was promised over and over in the Old Testament or in the Jewish Bible had come, and it was Jesus. And so he was a descendant of King David uh, some 900 years earlier. And in many prophecies uh, told that a Messiah or deliverer would come and be sent by God. But there was something unexpected here. So this was not just a man who would come to deliver people the, the is, Israel people from Roman oppression, but he was actually God come as a man to do what man could not. And so in Jesus' day, uh, the people would have a difficult time kind of unraveling um, the years of teaching that missed the mark about the identity of the Messiah. And so to them, he was supposed to be a deliverer um, from their enemies. But um, as we have seen, in earlier chapters of Matthew, the pronouncement of the angel was that, more importantly, Jesus would come to save his people. Uh, so to many, he would be a disappointment because they thought that political liberation was more important. Um, but last week, we spoke about um, how the events, the various events of Jesus' life um, in chapters 3 and 4 of Matthew point to him as the promised king of Israel. And so some of those signs, uh, just, just as review, were this. So like any king in his time, uh, he had a herald, somebody that went before him to herald his coming. And so that was John the Baptist. Um, Jesus also had a coronation ceremony, um, but that, that was his baptism. This was his coronation, and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit showed up. Um, Jesus was tempted also to show his worthiness to be a king. And so Jesus was led out in the wilderness and tempted for 40 days. And he passed all those temptations. And it shows us that he is a king that we can trust. He's, not, he's beyond corruptibility. Like the earthly kings become corrupt and begin to do all sorts of things. So we can trust Jesus because he passed those temptations as a king. So also, he called followers um, to join his administration, so to speak. And, um, and he began to live and minister to all sorts of people without distinction. So not just the Jews, but he showed that the kingdom of God was for everyone that came to him in faith. So the passage that we're going to look at today has been described as the greatest sermon that it was ever preached. And uh, that's actually what we would expect, uh, because since it was from Jesus and uh, that he preached it, and uh, we know that he is the Son of God, God become man. So the big picture, or the whole world view that we need to have is in these next few chapters of Matthew, is that there are laws or principles of the kingdom of heaven given by the king to his subjects. So that's what's going to be happening in these next few chapters. And uh, so Jesus is ushering in a new age. And uh, something new is here, and all of his followers will live by these laws. And so, in this uh, passage that I'm about to read, Jesus will be illustrating the uh, be like this attitudes that each person in God's kingdom possesses. So, he shows why they are necessary and how they are used. And so, um, the essential principles that Jesus taught are these. He showed us how to live with God and man. Also, he showed us how to endure. And also, he showed us how to bring change to others. 
And so I'll read the passage now from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no good, no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are a light to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the first thing that we notice in these verses is is that there's a lot of blessedness. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are the meek. So if you've heard a sermon about this passage some other time, you've probably heard that the word blessed means happy. Now, the New Testament of the Bible, of uh, which this book, Matthew, is a part, was originally written in Greek. And uh, so the Greek word blessed is makarios. And it is translated both as happy and as blessed. Um, It's one of those words that meant both. Now, what I'm going to do in this passage is go with blessed. Um, And here's why. So a person can be happy um, all by themselves, honestly. Um, They can be happy in their circumstances or their place in life or just how things are going. And the question is, where is God in all of this happiness? Um, The Bible speaks of living in relationship with God. And uh, where is God if blessed means happy. Um, Many people are happy and do not live or have God in any place in their life. And so, um, besides, does it make sense to say happy are those that mourn? Um, They're clearly not happy, and so it must be something more than that. And so, you'll also notice that as a result of being blessed, they receive something. Um, So, blessed are the poor in spirit for for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so on and on. And so this shows that blessed means that a person will receive something, and it's not just because they're happy. It's because God is too. So God is pleased and actively gives blessing to a person with these attitudes or disposition in life. And so there's a famous chapter in the Bible in the Old Testament that states that the blessings that God will give for obeying His laws. And so it's in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and I'll read verses 1 through 3. So, and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of His commandments that I, this is Moses speaking, command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. And it goes on and on. The point is, it's the Lord that one is the one that blesses. So He is the one that makes it happen. And so the second thing that we should notice is that those that are blessed have already received. 
um, the words say, blessed are. That's past tense. Blessed are. And so this means that because of their way of living, they are already blessed and are going to be further blessed. So this is important to understand that these people are already blessed. Now, you notice that Jesus said to his disciples, he said, you are the light of the world. Uh, So this shows that these people depicted in these Beatitudes are already in the kingdom of heaven. So these Beatitudes are descriptions or illustrations of people that have already been blessed. And so the question is, why is it important to see this? And uh, we know this because if we look at the commonality among these various attitudes that, are, that bring blessing, what is it that's common among them? So it is that people depicted here are giving, they're merciful, they're self-sacrificing, they're not looking out for themselves, but they're looking out for others, and they're focused on God. And um, so as Christians, we know how that happens. We know how that happens. It is because God has shown us mercy, therefore we can be merciful to others. It's because they know God that they can mourn over sin and injustice and not be overwhelmed because they know that there is hope and comfort in God. So because they know that Jesus died for them and for their sins, rather than asserting his own innocence, Jesus was meek, trusting himself to God, and he was crucified on the cross. So he did not use his power, he did not use his power to get what he wanted or to prevent what he did not want, but instead refused to use his power and submitted himself to God's will. He was crucified on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Because Jesus was meek, those people that are already saved by him are blessed with the same attitude an attitude that trusts God to make things right and equal so that they do not have to do that for themselves. So nine times in these verses it says, blessed are, they are already blessed. So it's important to see this so that we're not trying to earn our way to heaven um, based upon trying to be like the people that are depicted here. So as Christians, we know that no one is worthy of a place in the kingdom of heaven. Um, It is given as a gift and not because we're good enough or because we've earned a right standing with God. The Christian understands that it is despite who they are that they are in the kingdom of heaven. It is God's mercy and grace that he gives as a free gift. So we receive the free gift of forgiveness when we put our faith in Jesus Christ who died for us. And so it's essential to understand this this first when looking at the descriptions of the blessed people, that they are not earning favor because of it. They've already been changed because of God's favor toward them. So Jesus said this in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So God takes the initiative to save people. Uh, And these Beatitudes show what people be like after they are saved by Jesus Christ. Okay, so now we've got a few things out of the way. Um, We need to focus on what Jesus is saying to us in these Beatitudes. Um, I cannot do better than what Jesus has already spoken to us. And it's uh, written down. These Beatitudes are written in our Bible so that we can, we can take them ourselves and read them, study them, meditate on them, memorize them. Um, and the only thing I can do is maybe clarify a few things. Um, but the Beatitudes are for us to meditate upon. And so we've printed out, see some people have the yellow piece of paper. Um, those are Beatitudes and uh, stick them in your Bible, but most of all, read them and maybe begin to memorize those this week. Meditate on them. What, what, would that, what would that attitude be like in my life if I had that in the things that I'm dealing with right now? So, <clears throat> so the first of all, the Beatitudes show how to live with God and man. Um, and there are eight 
beautiful attitudes, thus called be attitudes, um, that exemplify Christ and uh, those people that have been changed by him. Now, the world has its own attitudes, and we could call them the UG attitudes or ugly attitudes um, because they are the opposite of beauty. So we are very familiar with them because we all live them to we all live them to some various degrees. Okay, so let's look at UG attitude number one. Happy are the proud in spirit, for they do not have to see their real need. Um, but Jesus says, the next slide. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So a person poor in spirit is not, uh, it's not talking about physical poverty here, but a person that has spiritual poverty. They know that they have nothing and they have no way to change themselves. And uh, that's actually a very difficult place to be um, until you know that God gives grace to the humble. It's hard to know that you have nothing. But when God brings faith into your life, you, you trust him, and you know that he, he is with you. So the poor in spirit have called out for God's mercy, and he has heard them. So in Luke 18, uh, we have a perfect example of a person that's poor in spirit. And so he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So the Pharisee, which is the teacher of the, the, the law, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, the man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So that's what it means to be poor in spirit. Let's look at the next UG attitude. UG attitude number two. Happy are those that are pleased with themselves, for they do not need any comfort. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So a person saved by Christ mourns over their sin. They know that they have been forgiven, but the vestiges of sin still remain. And uh, so they, they long for righteousness in the day that God will remove all sin from them. They mourn because they know that God has been dishonored. But they also know of the comfort of God's compassionate heart. So we see this in Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your iniquity is pardoned. Let's look at UG attitude number three. Happy are those that assert themselves, for they will get what they think they want. But Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So Psalm 37 by David says this. It says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath, for those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. So a meek person is a person that's self-controlled. Um, they could take what they want, but instead they leave that to the Lord. So meek people wait for the Lord, and they take shelter in Him. So as an example of meekness, we can look at the one who wrote that psalm that I just read, David. And uh, God had promised to David that um, he would be king. And so God had rejected Saul, the first king of Israel. And, uh, but, but Saul was still in power, and Saul was chasing and trying to kill David because he knew he was the successor. And there was more than one opportunity for David to have killed Saul, um, and that's shown in the Bible. But he knew that that would be taking matters into his own hands and that 
it would be wrong. And so he did not touch the Lord's anointed one, which was King Saul. So he waited for God to take Saul out of the way, but he suffered years of hardship because of that waiting. And so that's what it looks like when somebody is meek. It takes a lot of strength to restrain ourselves. Let's look at UG attitude number four. Happy are those that are self-righteous, for they will not be satisfied until all are canceled. But Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So righteousness is the quality of doing all that God wants. Um, It's the positive side of being sinless. Um, It's not merely sinless, but having done all the good works that God has planned. So it is God who transforms the heart so that it longs for what God wants. We understand what God says in Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God prepared your life in advance. He prepared the good works for you to do, and He wants you to fulfill them. So a righteous person is not just a sinless person, but one who actively does God's will. Let's look at UG attitude number five. Happy are those that exact justice, for they shall get what is fair. Versus what Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So you do not want what is fair from God. Um, If you get what is fair, you will be in hell. So a merciful person knows that they are the problem. Um, They ask God for mercy and not for what is fair. It's not fair that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but it was merciful. So we don't try to force change on others, but rather forgive as we have been forgiven. So we could continue with the UG attitudes, but you already know what the world thinks uh, because you're a part of it. And uh, we also think that way too. Um, But Jesus forgives us and he cleanses us when we fall back and we succumb back to those ways again. Blessed are the the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those that are already in the kingdom of heaven do for others what God has done for them. So Jesus showed the uh, principles uh, that for how to live with God and man, but, and he also shows us how we are to endure. And so in verse 10 of chapter 5, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus had to show his followers that they would be persecuted, uh, that there would be people spreading misinformation uh, about them. And so Jesus showed his followers that they would be blessed in heaven, just like the prophets that came before them. So I think that must have impressed the disciples to think of themselves as being counted as equal among the prophets. To the degree that a person is persecuted for their faith, they are counted in with the prophets and given a prophet's blessing. So the writer of Hebrews um, reviews the lives of people of faith in the Old Testament. And so Hebrews 11, 13, following, it says, these people, these heroes of faith, all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. 
So Jesus has done several things in teaching us in this passage. He showed us the principles of how to live with God and man. He showed us how to endure. And now he's going to show us how to bring change to others. So after the Beatitudes, uh, Jesus continues his teaching in verse 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is good, no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a light or light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Changed people change people. So a Christian is one who reflects the light of God, what the light of God has shown on him or her. So we're like the moon. Um, it has no light of its own, but it just reflects what is shown on it by the sun. So we are a city. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Um, they collectively, or the church, is the city that's set on a hill. Now, Florida's pretty flat here, but this church is set on a hill. Um, and we need to be a people that go out and shine our light. We need to be in the community so that the world can see us and not hidden under a bushel. So we need to be out there in the world giving light to all that need, need it. Change people, change people. Um, in conclusion, let me illustrate this with my own life. Um, they wanted me to switch the mics, I think. Are we good? Okay, better. Um, in conclusion, well, let me back up. Change people, change people. And what I'd like to do is illustrate that with my own life. When I was in high school, I was a pretty lonely kid. Um, I was like some of the Gen Z kids that we saw in the video, perhaps. Um, and high school can be maybe the hardest time of life uh, for people and college, too. Um, so, so we need to have a lot of compassion for students as they're trying to figure out uh, life and where they're going. But I was quite lonely because I used to stutter. Um, and because of that, I wouldn't initiate very well in relationships. And so I just found myself alone. Um, the Lord used that in my life. But um, I was lonely. And so um, by the time high school was over, I started having some friends. And uh, one invited me to church. And my family had dropped out of church years before, and I felt guilty because I knew that God was important. In any case, I went to church with them on Sunday nights uh, so that I could, you know, just be with some friends. And one night, something happened to me that I will never forget. And so two of my friends were talking to one another after the service, and they were a few rows up and ahead of me, and they were girls. And apparently, they had some kind of argument or spat between them, but one of the girls went up to her friend and apologized to her and said that she loved her. Now, I was stunned by that because I could see that they were mature beyond their age, which was probably about 16 years old. Um, and I knew it was because of their faith in Christ that they could do something so genuine and so loving. And... Uh, I'd never seen that, especially in people so young or among any friends that I'd ever had. And so I was kind of completely undone. Um, now, later, in talking to this young lady, uh, probably blubbering along, uh, I don't know about what, but she was insightful enough to know that I needed Jesus in my life. And so she shared the gospel with me. And so I think she shared John 3.16 first. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then she took me on a little journey through the book of Romans. In Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That rang true to me. I knew that everyone was a sinner. And also Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. And I sure felt like that. I felt like I was dead toward God. And, uh, 
But, she continued, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And when she said that, that somehow I knew that I got it. I knew where she was going. That eternal life must be a gift. And no one could earn it. It made sense to me. In Romans 5, 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And finally, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And so she asked me then the most profound question that I've ever been asked in my life. She said, David, have you ever asked Jesus into your life? And, and I knew at that moment that if I did, I would be putting my trust and my faith in Christ. And all these promises of the Bible would be then true for me. And so I said, no. And she said, would you like to? Yes. Um, that was my answer. And then she said, well, then pray after me. And she said, Lord Jesus, forgive me because I know that I've sinned against you. Please forgive my sin and come into my life. And I'm repeating this. Give me eternal life as a free gift. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Amen. So I prayed that prayer, and I knew that I was saved, and not because of any virtue that I had, but despite my sin. And that's when I knew I was a real Christian. And so you see, changed people change people. And so I'm so glad for the change that God made in my friend that led me to Christ. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel that it changes us. Lord, we don't live all these virtuous beatitudes except that we're already changed by you. We can be merciful because you've been merciful to us. We can be meek because we can trust you with our lives. We thirst for righteousness because you put that hunger inside of us. Thank you, Lord, for the renewed heart that you give us as Christians and the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And so, Father, we give you thanks. We desire, Lord, to be lights in the world. Lord, help us, compel us, propel us, Lord, into the world that we can serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. with your spirit guide us by your presence how we need you God oh Lord lead us to your kingdom bring us back to freedom how we need you God how we need you God And oh Lord, fill us with your spirit, guide us by your presence, how we need you, God. Oh Lord, we will sing your praises, you are our salvation, be our strength and song, how we need you, God, how we need you, God. How we need you, God. How we need you, God. Oh, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Guide us by your presence. How we need you, God. Oh, Lord, we will sing your praises. You are our salvation.
salvation be our strength and song. How we need you, oh Lord, fill us with your spirit, guide us by your presence, how we need you, God. And oh Lord, fill us with your spirit, guide us by your presence, how we need you, God. 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 Oh, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Guide us by your presence, how we need you, God. Oh, Lord, we will sing your praises. You are our salvation. Be our strength and song, how we need you, God. How we need you, God. How we need you, God. And now for the benediction. And now for the benediction. Uh, the benediction is the blessing. Um, and it's right from the passage we just read, but it should be an encouragement to you from Jesus to his disciples. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Don't let that happen to you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. All I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and by my heart, on the altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire, take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I have and by my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire here I am God arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken My heart stands in all of your name, your mighty love stands true to the end. You will fulfill your purpose in me. You won't forsake me. You will with me. Here I am, God, arms wide open, Glory my life gracefully broken here i am god arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken to jesus to Jesus now, holding nothing back, holding nothing back. I surrender. I surrender.
Thank you. 